I'm not sitting down out of shock for the nice things that Ed said. Um, about me, it's rare that I hear nice things in a number of quarters. But the scripture says, Woe unto you, and all men shall speak well of you. I have never had that problem. <laughs> I don't suppose I ever will in the future. At any rate, I was traveling with my wife and two daughters, and I blistered my foot. As a result of that, I'm now wearing sandals again. And so I'm going to sit down and enjoy the rapport of professorial chair like this. Hal Lindsay and Josh McDowell told me for years, you should sit down, you should sit down, it's much easier. And I kept saying, I like to stand. And then I had to sit down, and uh, they were right for a long time. And I am now admitting that it is easier to teach as it is at college, university, or seminary than it is just to stand all the time and lecture. I thought today, dealing with the subject of apologetics, it would be a good idea to start with some definitions of terms. And Ed said something very interesting. He said that uh, mo a lot of you are practicing apologetics, and you ought to know what you're doing. Well, I think those of you that are practicing apologetics uh, on the practical level of evangelizing Mormons uh, do know what you're doing. Uh, a great many of you are ex-Mormons, and therefore you can speak authoritatively uh, about your background and your religious convictions as you knew them as a Mormon. Uh, there are different types of apologetics. And the word itself is derived from an old Greek word, apologia, which means to put up a defense. And you find this word used in the New Testament repetitively. And uh, yet today, the science of apologetics or giving people reasons for your faith uh, has been declared per se obnoxious by the Christian world. And they largely don't want to get involved in it because, first of all, the prerequisite for doing proper apologetics is that you do the incredible. You think. <laughs> then the second thing you have to do, which is equally incredible, is to study in a disciplined way in order to get your information together. There's only two kinds of people that do apologetics, the quick and the dead. And if you're not quick, you're very dead because there are people waiting out there just in a line to go after you. And uh, the church doesn't want to do apologetics by and large. She's being dragged into it, forced into it, compelled to it, backed up into it by virtue of the occultic explosion and the occultic explosion. And by liberal theology taking over the major denominations of our country and worldwide. Because of that reason, the church is now beginning to sniff in the direction that apologists have been trying to get them interested in for many, many centuries. There was a time when Christian apologetics, for almost 500 years, was the reigning approach to Christian evangelism. Apologetics, the defense of your faith, is the natural adjunct to evangelism. If you will, it's the handmaiden of evangelism. After you tell people Jesus loves you, died for your sins, rose from the dead, gives them the gospel, and a general outline of your Christian commitment, the next thing that happens is you get questioned or interrogated is the proper word. And at that juncture, you begin to practice, whether you know it or not, apologetics. You have to give reasons for why you believe what you believe. And that's what the church hasn't been doing for a long, long time. Not really giving people reasons. On my program, The Bible Answer Man, which by the grace of God has been phenomenally successful and is growing faster than we can keep track of it on radio stations all over the country, we learned something very important. We learned that whether it's Salt Lake City, Los Angeles, uh, Spokane, Washington, Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, New York City, Maine, Florida, you name it, any place the satellite takes us, we found out that people are writing in and asking questions, or calling in and asking questions. Now the interesting thing is, they're all asking essentially the same questions. Now that should register immediately. If everybody everywhere geographically is asking the same questions, they are not getting the answers anywhere. Otherwise, they wouldn't be calling in to get them from a Southern Baptist professor of comparative religions on a, net, a television satellite network, three of them in fact, sitting there six and a half hours a week, giving them answers their pastor should be giving them giving them answers the churches should be giving them, giving them answers their denomination should be giving them, giving them answers for the real problems that are facing them. 
Now, my job as a teacher is naturally, of course, to proclaim the gospel. But it's also important that you don't forget that the gospel, in its proclamation, demands a defense, an effective defense. Now, there are different kinds of apologetics, different ways of doing it. There's slop apologetics, which is around us on every side, where you just simply grab a hold of something because it looks good or sounds good or you read it someplace and you hurl it at the first unfortunate person across your path. That's slop apologetics. There's nothing behind it at all. There's no scholarship. There's nothing you can turn to. It's just what you heard or saw or thought. Then there's pop apologetics. That's a popular approach to a systematic defense of Christianity, drawing upon the scientific world, drawing upon the various disciplines of education as a means of trying to plug in to giving people reasons for what you believe. That's very popular. It's called pop apologetics. And then there's serious apologetics. This is done by the professor in the theological seminary. And unfortunately, most of the time, it's an elective. You are not forced to take those courses. Imagine that. You're forced to learn how to preach. You're forced to learn, learn Greek and Hebrew so you can exegete passages. You're forced to learn church history so you know about your background, but you're not forced to learn how to defend your faith. So that when you come out of a theological seminary with four years of college and three years of seminary behind you and a master's degree in theology, the average well-trained Jehovah's Witness can give you a whale of a hard time with a King James Bible and no education. And they've been doing it very successfully for a long time. The cults know why they believe what they believe. What they believe is wrong, but they know why. And they have reasons. And that's what often humbles Christians into silence. The fact that they're afraid that since these people appear to know so much more than they do, or are very glib in what they do know and self-assured, that if they open their mouths, they're going to get trumped on. And they're going to be embarrassed. The gospel will suffer defeat. And so... They follow the old adage. It is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than open one's mouth and dispel all doubt. <laughs> Neglecting completely the ministry of the Holy Spirit, whose job it is to convince the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, not ours. Jesus said the Father will give you the words to say when you need it. But it also means that you're supposed to know something about your faith and be able to give people reasons for it. When Mormonism began with Joseph Smith in 1830, it was mocked, laughed at, the people were looked down upon as ignorant and foolish, at very worst apostates, at best fools, who had just believed a wacky prophet. And then two or three ounces of lead made Joseph Smith immortal. And with those two or three ounces of lead and his blood, he became, quote, Joseph the Martyr, the transformation from Joseph the Peak Stone Gazer. And Mormonism was on its way. The Christian church said, don't bother with this. I mean, we shouldn't be involved in things like this. What we should do is just positively preach the gospel. And if this thing is of God, you can't resist it. And if it's not of God, it will fall by its own weight. So let's take Gamaliel's advice and go on about our way. And the church did that. And in the 19th century, they made the mistake which...